This is Animation Nights New York, Animator Interviews. My name is Yvonne Grinkovich, and first up in our series is an interview with Hannah Sural. And uh, the sound is a little bit bouncy, but it's a beautiful venue and it's a really nice place to meet. So uh, please enjoy. Thank you very much for, for participating in this interview. Thank you for having me for this interview. It's really a pleasure and you're doing a great event. It's fantastic. <laughs> no, thanks so much for that. Um, yeah, we have our uh, yeah, next event coming up. It's going to be really We're actually in Maiden Lane right now at 180 Maiden Lane. So that's uh, the ambient noise that you hear. <laughs> and there's the artificial grass here, <laughs> right. you know, we're sitting yes. on. Yes, we're lounging on it now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We should have done yeah. that. <laughs> We're at the picnic table. <laughs> but that we should have done that. We can next still, time. We can still move over. <laughs> Um, so where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Tübingen, which is a, a kind of like a university town, medieval university town near to Stuttgart in southern Germany. In Swabia it's called the region. And actually the interesting uh, story and related to animation is that Lotte Reiniger, the animation film pioneer, spent the last year of her life in Tübingen. And she left her complete, actually at that time, what was her complete heritage to the town of Tübingen. And there is a museum now. And so at the age of 14, 15, that was when she actually uh, passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, I was already quite familiar with, with her work and that was already an early influence for me. And it kind of set me on the path of animation in some ways. That's amazing, because that, I was wondering, that that was uh, one of my questions, actually. I, I wondered, uh, that's an incredible connection. So that's that obviously, that's a huge influence for you. And you can see the, the similarities in the work, especially uh, with your more recent film, Sai Lun Chai. Yes, Sai Lun exactly. Chai. yes <laughs> precisely, yeah. <laughs> Which is also another interesting parallel, because uh, Lotte Reiniger was, then she was creating uh, her film Prince Ahmed, which is the first surviving animated feature film in, in animation history. Um, she was much inspired by Southeast Asian and Chinese uh, shadow puppet play. Mm -hmm. And now that I'm teaching in Singapore, uh, I found that was a wonderful opportunity to somehow bring things full circle and create something which is, if you will, a fusion between the German Lotte Reiniger influence and then the local art traditions right from the place where I'm living now. So that was uh, a very, very interesting and fascinating artistic project for me. That's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah, I love um, I love that portion of the film and Silan uh, Chai when you have the puppeteer like let shall we help our hero right and it breaks from yeah, the animation exactly, yeah. to yeah it's kind of a breaking the fourth wall thing oh, there completely. yeah yeah so that that and actually that was, that was one idea uh, that um, came to me quite early on I have to say in the storyboards to kind of bridge between the world of animation and the world of a traditional shadow puppet play which is called Wayan Kulit and so we thought what can we do and I, that seems to seem to be a very natural uh, idea to do that and surprisingly I mean I'm not really a visual effects expert but um, we pulled that off with comparatively simple means in terms of uh, making that uh, quite convincing it, and it worked out pretty well I have to say. Oh no it was absolutely convincing because it took me I just sort of rack my brain <laughs> and um, think like is it wait is this a puppet piece <laughs> which would be fun and honestly they're so very related you know and, and there's so much uh, 2d puppet animation done in digital realm right. and actually what what was part of a whole artistic concept was really to think about okay what do we keep in terms of limitations like real puppets would have and what do we expand in terms of possibilities what is possible in animation so we deliberately didn't uh, engage with all the possibilities of animation but we kept some elements from the original shadow puppet play like this very sudden flipping over of a, yes. the puppets which is an idea that comes from the 
original Wayang Kulit. So, and that was uh, a very um, interesting and uh, also sometimes challenging process to to make the right choices there. Yeah, no, that's that, it's, that's fascinating, and um, the sort of self-imposed limitations. That's something I know you've talked about before with something like the Lego Movie, right? It's um, uh, creating in this time where you have you know limitless possibilities, um, sort of thinking about clarity of mission, right, within the, within the project and clarity of message, and then picking and choosing uh, limitations just for the for each project, right, for each project. I think that's very very important, particularly because now we're looking at basically really limitless possibilities. So. Uh, the danger is that you get lost within these limitless possibilities and if you're just randomly choosing and picking from those without a concept behind or without also deliberately stripping away some of these possibilities for a reason that is then uh, it can be that you uh, in the end come up with a piece that is really lacking cohesion and a, a clear artistic vision and I think that that's also a message I'm trying to send out that I'm teaching to my students that is really more important than ever I believe to have a, a unique vision and something that really uh, reasonably select certain options from these limitless possibilities right no that's it's so important no that's fantastic um, did you do a lot of so you talked about your uh, early influences obviously did you do a lot of drawing and stuff it's just as a child and did your I'm always curious about this. <laughs> yeah. um, were your parents involved in Co co complete, yeah, yeah. They were always incre incredibly encouraging. I mean, I very often tell people about that. That actually, uh, what is amazing, we're, we're three siblings, and two of our are animators, and one is a musician. And so, uh, we, they were always encouraging of artistic careers. And then, really, then I mean, like most of my my fellow animators colleagues um, of a similar age, and I think generally speaking. I was drawing since I can remember. So I was first starting uh, copying these uh, zoological encyclopedias, drawing the animals, and then drawing my own comics. And basically, um, the first step for really getting into animation was actually comics. I was doing comics all through my early, I mean, from the age of eight, I did my own comics. And then, then I was a teenager, I did these, these fanzines, which were kind of exchanged at that time still, because it was, uh, at that time, that was uh, the early 80s uh -huh. um, to mid 80s. And then they were still exchanged by snail mail between different people, different comic fans, artists all across Germany. And then that was uh, the equivalent of now, you know, opening your Facebook account. That was really, I mean, you you went to the the mailbox in the in the morning, and looked if there was something in there, and if there was a an envelope with a new fanzine that was really exciting. Yeah, yeah, you know, they're coming back now as well. Have you seen? Yeah, I, I heard about Yara saw some, you know. So it's actually interesting that that also what I noticed with my students that with all of these virtual, you know, like uh, environments completely digital environment there seems to be a certain certain longing or yearning going back to something that is really uh, tangible and kind of something you can you can touch and you can also because I think in a way it might be a little bit more precious because it's really an object and you can really see it and I mean I'm wondering is it just me because I'm really old or is it just really something that also there's a real value to it and and uh, um, students and younger people still still uh, appreciate that. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, it's surprising I saw someone on the train with one and I thought my goodness like this is it's really a thing and I, I've had a couple of conversations with uh, some college students who I don't it makes me laugh because I was also involved uh, in some some uh, zines <laughs> particularly it was backwards in Athens Georgia there are a lot of them right right and I still I still actually last year uh, somebody uh, took the effort and wrote a uh, almost like a scientific dissertation about this age of fanzines in, in, in Germany back in the 80s because 
interestingly, a lot of these people who were involved in that scene back in the day are all now in various positions. Really, uh, I mean, have made it, if you will, nice. in the kind of in the animation slash comics uh, slash illustration scenes, mm -hmm. and they're either editors, comic artists, professors. So, a lot of these people really followed that 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 early. A hobby into made it into a profession and and that's kind of like also an answer to your question about where you're involved early on with 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 drawing I think most of my colleagues I know uh, they were yeah yeah do you uh, still uh, keep a sketchbook now with you at all times so that, yeah kind 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 of uh, not really that I'm really diligently kind of uh, uh, keeping it or always carrying it with me but there's a funny anecdote I had a, a university seminar just before I came here which was more about administration and kind of um, more formal things and what I started doing in the course of a seminar, I started uh, drawing caricatures <laughs> of all the other, you know, conference participants. And first, I was hiding them, and then somebody came by and said, "Oh, that's uh, so and so." I said, "Well, yeah, but maybe you might not like it." And then, but then. Uh, Slowly but surely, all of these made the rounds, and everybody want, wanted to have a copy in the end. So, I mean, basically, uh, whenever I can um, engage with drawing, it just happens that I do. Yeah, no, that's excellent. That's excellent. Do you uh, do you use uh, video reference at all, or is that something? I'm just curious um, if if that's something because some people don't. You know what I mean? And, and then if you're in your if your backgrounds. Uh, comics and obviously you're you amazing uh, you're dr amazing draftsman <laughs> um, so but do you use a video reference now for a project? actually little I mm -hmm. have to say I mean it depends a little bit really on the the style mm -hmm. that is required what I what I do is more frequently that that I mean at times when something is more more complicated in terms of some kind of uh, physical process or kind of uh, then I sometimes uh, shoot myself or quickly shoot a, a, a friend, but it's, it's actually quite rare because I mean a lot of my work is very stylized, mm -hmm. so I can I can actually get away with a lot of things. Or also, it's even necessary that I move away significantly from reality and take take these liberties. And I find it's also it's it's a very um, tricky thing with live action reference, particularly then I also work with the students that. Um, it's very, very important that you use it the right way and that you really use it as a, as a basis to understand things rather than unless you're doing something hyper-realistic there it's really, really necessary to be uh, so naturalistic uh, to make it convincing. But in general, I think it's important to be able to exaggerate and to kind of really move away sufficiently from live action reference because otherwise it might end up looking stiff or not convincing, not exaggerated enough, not fluid enough. So it's, it's a double-edged sword sometimes. Right. And it very much depends on the style you're using. Right, no, definitely. And um, I know you've touched on, on that before, sort of use of, uh, again, like per project, like use of uh, more stylized, uh, you know, creation of movement, cartoony movement. Uh, versus, you know, super realistic. Uh, I, I think it's just like one thing there, there I think the, the artistic intent is uh, most important. So in that sense, I'm not ideological or ideologic at all. So I think if, if really the artistic concept of a movie, let's say in visual effects, really requires that you have to create a vision or an, an impression that something is believable and it fits that world, then of course you would uh, use whatever you need to uh, achieve that certain impression. But I think then it comes to animation in its purest form or our animation as it's very often used in, in, in independent animation, then um, 
I'm some somehow surprised at times how much uh, artists uh, self limit themselves by just really being trying to be too literal, too naturalistic, and not really using that 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 beauty of a line of action. So I mean, I I mentioned that I recently just interviewed John Canemaker, and I saw in many of his uh, films there is this. Uh, line of action quality there something is really reduced to the essence and it becomes almost pure animation um, which is also for example very uh, beautifully demonstrated in that Fantasia 2000 segment Rhapsody in Blue yeah. so the Eric Goldberg uh, design based on Al Hirschfeld drawings and I think that that fluidity that that fluid quality is just something that that is very unique to animation and and uh, Sometimes it's important to reduce to the max to achieve that very pure form of animation. Yeah, no, I understand. And um, so then, how um, do you have a? What's your process to sort of divorce yourself from that video reference? Then is it a matter of thumbnails? Very much. I mean, basically, then, then, then I. I mean, it's always about redrawing. Yeah. So and and. Uh, that means when I look at the reference, I would just really try to figure out, okay, what's really going on there? How is the weight being shifted in that certain, if somebody's getting up, what is important is to understand how is the weight shifted in, in the different positions. Um, so how is the next momentum being gained? But then I translate that definitively in my, into my own thumbnails. And a second part of the process is actually then to very often use the very initial thumbnails as a basis for, for keys and for breakdowns because that's also something, a mistake I very often find with, with um, students who just start with animation, that they uh, redraw their, their thumbnails in a way that all the, the freshness, the spontaneity gets lost and then there will never be an tell. I mean, look, I mean, even if you work on the computer, I mean, at least use these as, a, as an inspiration and blow them up and kind of really use them as uh, something that reminds you how expressive your poses have to be and how imaginative your breakdowns would have to be to uh, achieve, uh, to keep that freshness from the start. Same thing happens in CG, right? It becomes, uh, it gets mushy, like the, you, it's easy to lose your keyframes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that, is, that is something there, there, I mean, I also supervise now a lot of uh, CG projects. I mean, also for my own work, but also primarily then I'm, then I'm mentoring final year projects at our university. So that is very often one of the key things to remind uh, the artists, be it, be it professional artists or students, that they really have to push the, the CG animation and, and uh, of course it sometimes you get all of these um, problems but increasingly less so in the, that, the, that the rigs might break or something like that and it, it, particularly with CG you get technical difficulties but it's important to try to overcome these for a better artistic result. Do you, uh, I mean obviously there has been a lot of uh, technology since um, say like Fantasia, the original Fantasia, there's a lot of technology that's been created that's uh, created shortcuts for us. Um, I'm just curious, uh, so which of these shortcuts are you most thankful for? <laughs> oh well, I, I always say, I mean definitely one, one of the things I'm most thankful for, I mean I'm still one of those people who had to, in the beginning of his career and as a student had to dabble with real cells. <laughs> And then uh, one thing I, I am so happy that it's gone is that the dust oh. that collects in cells and then you have like eight cells on top of each other and in the end of the day, at the end, at the end of the day you will have just like all of this dust collecting and the cleaning was always a nightmare and you never got it completely cleaned and I think to work with an unlimited number of layers and with no loss, that is one of the big benefits uh, 
of uh, the computer-based 2D animation uh, and uh, stop motion uh, when it's flat stop motion. So that certainly is one of the things. Uh, other than that, I have to say, of course, uh, what is wonderful is that what you can do now with um, digital animation is you can keep a richness of, of patterns, for example, in digital 2D, digital cutout, um, and you can still animate in quite sophisticated ways uh, using certain tricks and shortcuts. So that's very nice because, of course, I like coming from a design point of view uh, because I'm. For my films, I think the design is just as important as the animation. Although I really love animation, I really uh, it's very important for me that it's nicely animated. But it was previously, in the pre-digital age, very often a challenge to combine a very intricate graphic design, very rich graphic design, and then full animation, and that has become certainly easier. Right. Yeah, the, um, you're, specifically I'm thinking of uh, the cold heart, you use... Uh, there's more of a, a, a very there's a very graphic element, obviously, of the characters, and then um, you know intentional use of color and scale change to sort of uh, designate power shifts. And uh, and I'll actually you welcome to speak to that a little bit. It's a, a terrific film, <laughs> but um, the, there's almost it's almost like uh, it is camera work, um, but it's also. Uh, the character, the animation, and the scale is pushed so far, um, uh, and in such a effective way, you know, to tell that story. Well, I mean, thank you for the nice, kind words about the film, and I, I really think that is one of the films I really felt I wanted to get done. So it was really something there. I felt I really wanted to push uh, this as much as close to perfection as I as I could, and this was also a, a fairy tale. It's a famous German fairy tale. I've been fascinated with since I was a little kid. So I always had that idea in my mind. One day I want to make a film of it, and there have been several live action versions just recently there has been one last year but there has never been an animated version before and so far that's the, the only one and indeed um, what was important to me artistically with the film was to really use scale use color to really express emotions to express uh, certain dramaturgic elements in a way that support the story and really to take out all stops to really uh, work uh, in a way that really doesn't consider a realistic approach but a very expressionist approach in using shapes, colors, movements to support the expressions or to express the emotions of the characters. What is um, important to know about the color script is that I was so lucky to be able to work with Hans Bacher, uh, who did the color script for the film. And Hans is my colleague in, in NTU in Singapore, but he's also a world famous animation pro production designer who worked with Disney for many, many years. And he started working actually um, in international animation, if I'm correct with Emblin. Uh, back in the 1980s on movies like Balto and then later on went on to uh, join Disney as a production designer for movies like Aladdin, The Lion King and uh, I think most prominently in terms of his involvement Mulan which is a film which is almost exclusively based on his design work and uh, so it was a great uh, um, privilege to have him on board and uh, he did all the color design uh, for the film and it was really uh, our shared intent to use color as you already said as uh, an element in the film which really completely reflects the story. So that really has dramatic changes there. Um, we're using 
very few uh, and kind of like very expressive color schemes and everything goes along with the way the story moves so when it becomes more dramatic more uh, powerful or violent you know the reds and the violence the violets dominate uh, then then again if it's melancholic there's more blues and and greens but it's hard to really describe that in words because uh, that sounds easy in theory but the way uh, Hans pulls it off in his colors is just really amazing because of course you always have to uh, make two things happen at the same time one is kind of a harmonious color concept but also uh, to pull off sufficient contrast in the colors and to also combine colors in such a way that they are at the same time conflicting and harmonizing which is seems to be almost impossible but but he pulls that off beautifully and I think throughout it's a great support for the storytelling yeah I also um, the character designs too and how you deal with characters versus environment are really interesting because um, there's a real uh, depth in some of the camera movements and a lightness to the characters and, it's and then Andrew. yeah, yeah it's amazing and um, and then uh, and other times there's a, a claustrophobic kind of feel the characters become embedded in the environment and the sort of outline uh, of the character in the environment it's really interesting um, there are just so many different uh, you know, contrasts of uh, different t variables, you know, like going on in the film and um, it's effective. <laughs> it's, it's great. I mean, thank you so much. I mean, you have such a deep understanding of, of a film, you know, I mean, also like it, I mean, as a creator, one is very happy, you know, when then one sees that what you have in mind as an artist also is being understood and appreciated by the audience or a reviewer. And that that is fantastic. I mean, the, the idea was, indeed to make the, the backgrounds also a character if you will so that they become part of a storytelling because that is one of the things there I think in the traditional way of um, storytelling for particularly in feature animation is there's a separation between character and, and background and I think that is kind of a uh, psychological element or kind of uh, an artistic uh, attitude or uh, approach which might still hail from the old separation between cells and backgrounds whereas today in computer animation that doesn't exist anymore but on the other hand what I think is one of uh, the, the big uh, advantages of 2D traditional or 2D digital animation still is that you can change anything at any time at your will. Yeah. <laughs> so you're not really, it's not necessary to rely on a model which has been built virtually, but if you want to ch the, the background to change in a certain way, then you can do it at any time. So you're completely free, but of course, redrawing the background all the time. So that, that's quite a, a nightmare in terms of work. <laughs> so, and that was certainly one of the reasons why this film took very long. I mean, from, from script to, to finish, it was eight years. Um, but the, the, the production time itself may be about four years. And yeah, it's also half an hour long. And maybe one more thing that, that is uh, interesting uh, to think about, um, then we look back through the history of, uh, of 2D feature animation, or we look back through the history of uh, Disney just as an example, you would always find two different approaches. One would be uh, that the characters are very different from the backgrounds in terms of the style. So you got these lushly painted backgrounds without outlines. Um, and the characters are outlined with flat colors. But then there's films that, for example, 101 Dalmatians, <laughs> there you have actually uh, a congruence between character style and actually also uh, the background style. Because in this case, both were sharing the same uh, design qualities. And I think another thought with the cold heart was really to create a world, a seamless world, where everything really kind of fits together, belongs together, and uses both background and character to tell the story. That's, that's great. Yeah, I know it, it definitely works. I mean, it's a beautiful film. 
Um, <laughs> and it's really, it's a, it's a, it's a true credit to you to make a half an hour. Because as you know, you know, the longer the films get, the more challenging it is to. <laughs> I, I know. I was actually, I was actually uh, quite, quite thankful in the end that 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 film. Uh, despite the length still enjoyed a, a very successful festival run and and won quite a number of awards precisely because of that reason because obviously a festival programmer uh, and I've been on also on both sides of a uh, defense you know also being in selection committees uh, repeatedly yeah. through the years so of course I mean like if there's a half hour film that means at least three hour films have to go <laughs> and that is uh, a tough call to make yeah. for any festival programmer and on the other hand I thought and And that is something that I still believe is true. That story, the minimum amount of time you need to tell is really half an hour. Actually, the, the source material easily can be used for a feature film. And uh, we we managed to, or actually it was me writing the script together with a script advisor. We managed to, to bring it to the half hour by really asking ourselves what is the essence of a story what is important how can we tell this story about somebody selling his own heart for money that's yeah. what it is yeah. uh, how can we bring it down to 30 minutes and still make it work and hopefully it, it worked out fine what do you think the importance of mythology is for today's society like are you involved with you know comparative mythology um, you know you you tell all these stories from different cultures and use these enhance these stories with uh, animation um, but I'm, I'm curious to know like what uh, maybe your mission might be with all of this I, I, I'm not sure if I have a mission I mean <laughs> but I think what I mean it's actually it's a, it's a, it's a two-part answer uh, maybe we have to cut it later yeah <laughs> so we will see uh, so it's a two-part answer basically because uh, on the one hand I, I for me it's simply it's a very emotional access because I was always fascinated like I guess many people are with, with mythological stories or with myths, with uh, sagas, with fairy tales. Because, but I think the reason for that is that there are sim simply many, many archetypes which remain valid through our time. So, I mean, if you take the story of a cold heart as an example, I mean, it's basically about the power of greed and the temptation of, of greed and how actually somebody who is at his very heart a good-hearted soul literally gives away the heart sells the heart just to become rich and as if we look around i mean uh, that always remains sadly very contemporary and um that that idea resonates throughout the ages and will probably never age or go away you know one would hope so but it's it's probably not the the case and um and it's also besides these really really deep deep reasons i think there is a playfulness at work in fairy tales and myths that appeals to the majority of people appeals to the the child and the man or the grown-up if you will so and it's just really um, it offers the potential to engage in something which uh, transcends your your daily or your mundane existence and and I mean you could look at that negatively but uh, if you take the example I just mentioned it also still reflects reality so you ha can have it both ways and so it's a it's an endlessly fascinating topic for an artist for that very reason and of course also in fairy tales and myths, you get these incredibly uh, intriguing images of fantastic creatures, fantastic landscapes, other worlds, and so forth. And you cannot help but want to illustrate it. And the other thing is that, indeed, I do engage quite a bit also as a researcher with adaptation and particularly with, with adaptation for animation. So I indeed do a lot of comparative studies, but interestingly, um, 
it is if I really look at it I see more communalities between with between cultures than actually separating elements of course each culture is different and it's good that it is you know I mean it's really important that that this has been acknowledged but what I find very often is that there are certain topics certain stories and motifs which appeal across cultural barriers mm -hmm. and so I find it very interesting usually starting with a creator interviewing creators then they um, are adapting such stories to find out about their own approach and to see what motivates them to, to adapt certain stories what do they leave out where are they faithful to the source material where do they deviate and for what reason what choices do they make for visual development and so forth that that is i find something which is endlessly fascinating and did you did you want to uh, mention your the project you're working on now the the book that you're working on yeah, right now I'm 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 writing a book uh, for Focal Press, which is about adaptation for animation. Um, and for that book, I have now interviewed quite a number of uh, famous animators, like for example Ishu Patel and uh, John Kanemaker, uh, among many many others. Also talking about some of my own work, which is largely um, uh, adaptation for animation, and also talking to animation scholars like John Alberto Bendasi and again John Kanemaker, who is both a scholar and an artist and famous at both yeah. uh, so um, and I've that is very very interesting because uh, by doing so I gain a lot of insights in the different approaches but also in the communalities why uh, that, that that different artists share and why they are indeed fascinated by mythology and fascinated by fairy tales and and literature as well so there's also a whole range of um, adaptation source material covered in this book which uh, uh, kind of ranges from modern poetry to classical fairy tales to uh, Asian mythology and many many other different uh, uh, potential liter literary sources. Also, Shakespeare is a big, big topic there. Uh, Shakespeare plays that have been uh, very frequently animated throughout animation history. All well, the world's a stage is a really terrific uh, piece too. And that was also an idea to to make some some fun, of course, you know, to be play with to play with shapes mm -hmm. in animation for the design to to reduce to the max. But then also to kind of um, visualize the irony that is actually inherent in, in the text. Because I think there is something, obviously there is a kind of uh, a dry wit to, to the text, of course, because uh, it's in a way a very laconic description of human life as a whole. But as such, it is so true. And then um, I was just trying to to add on the words by the visual commentary instead of just really kind of illustrating it, and really to to do something which uh, takes on a more universal meaning by being as uh, put it in another way to avoid being too literal and to really by using very basic shapes only mm -hmm. allow for identification again if you will across cultures and across uh, cultural barriers I enjoyed also this the sound design for that piece too like even the fire uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah 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 so I mean that's it's always good you know like if, if it is uh, funny when it's supposed to be funny it helps you know sometimes the other way around can also happen but yeah and it's also like what is what is uh, I was also lucky in that respect that with Samuel West a really great Shakespeare uh, actor and director actually was 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 providing uh, in a way a very British way of narrating that tale because I mean for some reason I wanted to have the text the narration being very Shakespearean <laughs> and still 
he has this great you know underlying irony mm -hmm. to it which is also very british you know in his delivery which also adds another level you know so yeah. i mean kind of uh yeah <laughs> and it's it's short i mean for for once i think maybe that was my my my, my uh antidote or counter therapy <laughs> to the, the cold heart you know that i mean then you made now it's a while ago already the film mm -hmm. came out in 2013 but still okay let's do something short you know we did 30 <laughs> minutes let's do one one minute and 30 <laughs> seconds you know and then we're done also to make the lives of festival programs yeah. <laughs> a little bit easier easy, easy, easy to fit yeah, yeah. yeah it's easy to program yeah, yeah. <laughs> i would say yeah the cold heart did sort of sit in the queue for a little while like what will we do <laughs> yeah yeah so so i mean i know that that from other festivals but then all the more I was extremely happy to see that that it was acknowledged quite quite a bit. So now it has um, almost 100 festival screenings, and and I still think you know it's still one of the films where when I look back, well, good that I did it, and good that I mean it it I got funding for that, but it still cost as it always it cost a lot more money. But I mean still something there there I think you know great that I did it. I'm so happy, and I'm still happy with the outcome. I'm curious how, what advice you might have for uh, people in, coming into the uh, professional world as freelancer, um, like pitching uh, internationally or just pitching in general or getting, because I know, you know, it varies, it depends on sort of where you live sometimes and I've actually talked about this uh, briefly and, and whether or not there's funding, but you know, obviously, you know, here in the, in the US we're, you know, it's you have to you know freelance and you know figure it out however you can you can't really um there's not a lot of funding like from government and stuff but um but uh with regard to pitching i mean i think that's always a, a good question to ask uh it could be you know applicable it's something that's not really taught i, I think in, in a lot of programs right 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 i mean uh one of one of the things uh before we even get to pitching i think one of the things that is really important because I see this very often happening with with students when you advise them on their first career steps. Um, it's important to be open, be flexible. That means there's not only one way, but there's many ways, and they're not mutually exclusive. So very often that thinking, uh, the thinking uh, with young students or beginners might be that okay, I have to achieve this and I have to do take these certain steps and then I have to make a decision for one or the other. That is true in a certain sense that of course you cannot be good at everything in the world, but on the other hand, um, you can combine to a certain extent a full-time position with you know getting your your the foot in the door with uh, with freelancing, with moonlighting. I mean one of the big 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 important um, uh, advice uh, I can give is that you have to engage as early as possible with, with uh, getting commissioned work so it's very often a big misconception that once you get your degree you step out of the door and the world is waiting for you right. which, which sounds very funny in the first place but it is something that um, if you want to make a living as a freelancer I think it's tremendously helpful to already have at least a few pieces being uh, published or being commissioned during your studies because that will help so much when you go in the next steps of looking for work that people will take you seriously and it kind of you get out of this vicious cycle that somebody doesn't trust you because you haven't really done anything that has been published and so forth. That is one thing. Um, the other thing is, or the other things are, it's uh, very, very uh, basic advice. Um, don't be overly distrustful of, of people because, I mean, there are so many stories circulating how how people have been cheated and have been, you know, like, and of course, um, you have to care pro bono, at uh, pick pro bono work, for example, very carefully, but, um, if you don't have another job waiting down the line, it's always better doing something than doing nothing. Yeah. The worst thing is just sitting around, biting your nails, should I do it or should I not? And then yeah. the opportunity is gone. And what I also find is 
if such opportunities show up, I mean, it could be a competition. It could be that a professor introduces you to somebody else and says, okay, maybe this is a chance. Really go for it, jump at it. Uh, don't wait forever. Don't be too hesitant. And I think what is one of the most important things is in terms of getting jobs is of course, word of mouth. Uh, that doesn't always work. I mean, uh, when I look throughout my career is that uh, Many, many different pr approaches have worked. One could really be back in the day, it was just really sending uh, video cassettes. Now it would be email and links and so forth, but still you have to follow that up usually with a phone call, even if it's something I completely understand people don't like to do because who wants <laughs> to get on the nerves of people and so forth. <laughs> But um, it's very important to be persistent and to try uh, to slowly um, get one job after the other. And as I said, sometimes it has worked for me that I was recommended by somebody else, sometimes a fellow student or former fellow student was looking for people to work with. So that's another important thing, really building networks, keeping these networks going. And sometimes really it was the real cold calls, acquisition. I sent something somewhere and I got lucky once I remember for German television. Um, I was just sending something there. Uh, the integration of cartoon animation into a live action series was required and that resulted in a 70,000 D-Mark at that time commission, which really there was no big plan to it. It was just like maybe to a certain extent plain luck, but had I sent my tape at that time, that would have never happened. Right, right. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, that's good advice. That's good advice. And another, and another thing is really that, that I mean, I have one student who is, who is doing PhD with me now, mm -hmm. and um, I always kind of uh, present her as a, as a great example of somebody who uh, has worked in ad agency as a senior art director even and at the same time was moonlighting doing her own illustrations uh, then getting an agent um, and then also being able to uh, make quite a career which is ongoing now as an independent illustrator um, and I think the downside is of course you have to work a lot but don't put too many barriers in your way by saying okay I can either do this or that yeah. and I have to make that decision and between option A and option B I just sit there waiting that is not gonna work for you yeah it's true I, I actually uh, I got a little a bit of advice from uh, these two guys who had a small studio and um, and they were terrific because they were so um, open about their process you know what I mean and really um, explained you know how they started and what they were doing basically said they said to me um, you know look for work everywhere like don't don't ever think like oh well I you know should like d like don't be embarrassed about your sources for freelancer you know what I mean because it's something that's that's interesting yeah, like, yeah absolutely yeah they're absolutely. like because you never know who you're gonna you know run across or stumble up I mean one one of the things is that that um, okay let's put it that way first of course it's sensible and right that artists should not go below certain rates however on the other side you really have to pick and choose who your client is I mean if you would go and just you know uh, looking for work from everywhere you know of course you would not uh, charge your um, kind of like small shop owner you know from the corner of a street the same amount then from you know from coca-cola and then it's kind of like also very very um, reasonable to make a difference there and also to take into account that unless you have a lot of competing offers which are possibly better every kind of work you're doing uh, that is also something for your portfolio and if you're approaching and trying to approach the, every job with the same sincerity it will also help to build your reputation and it's actually something um, uh, very good to keep that professional attitude throughout I mean one I have one funny anecdote which is from a different field it's uh -huh. teaching but it shows the same idea I think then I started into getting into part-time teaching by the end of the 90s. 
there was this one class there I ended up for some reasons which were actually not even actually basically nobody's fault but the class had only three students <laughs> and then of course then at the end of the day you feel okay fun, um, yeah 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 it was fun in the end you know but of course you know uh, a, a possible reaction would have been to say okay I'll be very emotional about it I, I doubt myself why does nobody love me why don't they take my class you know instead I really took that on and said, it doesn't matter if I have like three students or 35, yeah. I will just really, I mean 35 is too much anyways, <laughs> uh, but I will do that class really did the maximum professional effort and make it as good as I can. In, in the end, it really turned out fun, you know. Yeah. So I think it's important to have a certain professional attitude you, you apply across fields and you don't make it depending on the size of a job and the size of a budget. That's great. <laughs> and who do you, who are your favorite animators? If you had just to pick a small handful. Let's think who I could, who I could think of. Um, I mean, certainly Eric Goldberg, when yes. we look towards, towards uh, uh, Disney and kind of like uh, commercial animate, because he's just like such a genius in both design and animation. And I think that is something, um, has a little bit to do also what kind of work is is up your your alley yeah. and i find the the fluidity the the, the the of his animation the beauty of a design the the, the perfect simplicity and that is a compliment mm -hmm. in in that sense uh, i find that just just really admirable um then it comes to independent animation there's so many, uh, I kind of really, it's, a, uh, it's, it's really hard to think of where to start. I mean, certainly somebody who's amazing, I studied with that, but that's not the reason, is Andreas Ricarde from, from uh, also from Stuttgart, from the same university, and we know each other for a long time, but he's such, uh, really such a fantastic animator, really wonderful animator, and has produced such a... Uh, incredible body of work then going back um, uh, to uh, my school days also Thomas Meyer Hellmann who is now a producer primarily with studio film builder also in Germany but he did a lot of groundbreaking films in the in the 80s in Germany that opened new avenues for for animation particularly in in Germany I have to say uh, now going to New York somebody who, who I've always admired for his uh, and talking about groundbreaking of course for his uh, crazy humor and and uh, very sardonic wit is Bill Plimpton of course you know so uh, and there's there's actually many more when when you go to the classics uh, there's John and Faith Hubley uh, yes. then who are actually great examples of uh, animators or designers actually he's more of a designer if you will who worked with great animators but he was also somebody who was able to bridge between the world of design and animation in in a which were always corresponding, but uh, some people are more pure animators, some people are more purely designers, and he's, he's re they're, they're great filmmakers, if you think of Moonbird, for example. Um, so, and then uh, all-time idol also Ward Kimball of Disney's Nine Old Men, because his work, uh, like Whistle, Whistle, Toot, Plunk and Boom, you know, that is just, just one example, but he was somebody who was able to work uh, also at the highest level of quality feature animation, but still almost instill an author quality to his work um, within the Disney framework. Yeah, so just a few examples. Yeah. I can I can mention there's it's just already a thousand more I, I could think yeah. about you it's know an so. Question, but it is a fun one to answer like once you get going because yeah. Yeah, I mean as you keep going, yeah. more and more uh, examples <laughs> come up. You know, I mean basically it's also the whole UPA schools and many many. I mean like uh, then uh, 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 the Telltale Heart, you know, that Ted Parmley directed and Paul Julian designed. Uh, that is also an example of uh, great filmmaking because I mean it's very limited animation but it's just like such an amazing 
amazing amazing film and so yeah and then of course already mentioned Lotte Reiniger huge influence generally speaking I really admire as you can already guess uh, filmmakers animation filmmakers who can combine design and animation in new and surprising ways in our good at doing so or marvelous at doing so have you looked at any of the vr stuff and and i wonder what you'd say about uh sort of the state of things with regard to um uh, not just cg versus traditional or uh, animation but some of these newer platforms like um, using motion capture more and using uh sort of video game, well, motion capture, and then uh, the platform of VR, like, what do you, what do you think of, of what, sort of where we are right now? I mean, interestingly, I'm right now just engaging with VR in the sense that I'm just starting to do a project which uh, will, a research project which will ultimately result in an animated narrative uh, based on a, a Shakespeare play that might be either uh, Midsummer Night's Dream or The Tempest. We're still in the process of working with the Shakespeare Institute, trying out different options and so forth. Um, I think what is really, really fascinating is the many, many questions that are really open right now with VR. You know, how do you really tell a story? If you want to tell a traditional story, how do you direct attention of a viewer and how do you work with uh, challenges like editing? And I think one of the most successful pieces, I mean, recently Oscar nominated is Pearl, yes. uh, that, that I think does a pretty good job to, to tell a story convincingly in VR. But I think this is really just at the, um, the very beginning of a, a kind of like very exciting journey going forward. What, but what I kind of um, very uh, strongly support is the idea that definitely VR should not only be engaging with certain uh, game design aesthetics in terms of if you think of motion capture, of hyperrealism and so forth, because I think that is something that uh, is not at all necessary. I mean, you have all the options in the world what you could do in v VR, and I find it even more interesting to do something which is not really um, creating the suspension of disbelief through hyperrealism, but putting something which seems to be not real in an environment that makes it appear real. I mean, that's even more, I think, interesting or fascinating instead of simply reverting to the idea and there's many, many bad examples. I won't mention yeah. any, <laughs> of course. Uh, there, uh, the the hyperrealism seems to be the only option to to apply in terms of design style. Then you go into VR. I think it's much more interesting to do the opposite. And if you talk about, we talk about the good examples. I mean, certainly something like Pearl is not hyperrealistic. I mean, that's still highly stylized and uh, it's representational, but it is a really um, a good example of using stylization to c tell a convincing story in this new reality, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I can only imagine an environment like the one you created uh, in uh, uh, the Cold Heart in a virtual reality that that would that would be something you know it's that's more the idea where yeah. to go to you yeah. know i mean to do something that is really not the expected right. and find ways to transfer that to a fully immersive world yeah right, because you're already completely immersed yeah, yeah exactly. Im immediately yeah um have you played around with tilt brush or uh not, coil not, at all not not yet oh, yeah so actually great. you'll yeah. have to let me know when you yeah, do yeah, yeah. so actually it. right now right now is uh right now we're in that stage that we're trying to really figure out what what shakespeare play would offer the most potential you know also certainly in terms of world building mm -hmm. in terms of uh also finding a way to engage with a story maybe in non-traditional ways maybe in traditional ways but in vr so that's all at the very beginning and also finding the, the styles um, which is um, uh, very very fascinating and we're kind of uh, now i just hired the first uh, uh, kind of animators and uh, visual development artists so that the whole project will 
start in earnest from April 1st, actually very soon. Fantastic. And now we we really, that was also part of the, the, the conversation with John Canemaker, mm -hmm. because he has actually adapted Shakespeare himself with Bottom Stream, uh, a, a segment from a Midsummer Night's Dream. And uh, it's, yeah, so it's, it's interesting to do uh, a research on what is there already and then what could be the new avenues to take the whole the whole spiel to in the end that is excellent yeah wonderful this has been a terrific conversation i really enjoyed it what i really want to add uh, is that i'm very very happy to see and i, I hear that a lot from the, the animation community as well that uh, you're taking on you know the flying the flag of independent <laughs> animation uh, so successfully and in such a such a uh, convincing and very uh, committed way in New York City because I mean that's really a great place because I think that might be uh, at least one of the capitals of independent animation in the US there are a lot of uh, artistically more challenging kind of more uh, independent work is being produced and so i think and, and also sitting in this great space here <laughs> it's really uh quite fun to see because i can imagine and we see it always in the blog that a lot of people like to come here enjoy independent animation and you certainly have a community here who can possibly support that Every, it's energizing you know and i think everyone kind of feels that um, it, they make you want to, you know, to make more work. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. Because, I mean, that's always, I mean, at the end of the day, every filmmaker wants their films to be seen. Yeah. And it's always the biggest fun when you, when you uh, of course, when you see your work resonates with an audience. And also on a larger scale, then you see that independent animation uh, can find audiences and the, the audiences really uh, respond to that being shown because usually I mean there is such a variety now and such a richness of styles I mean on a on a really global scale that I mean it's absolutely no problem to, to put together really wonderful engaging and beautiful programs what do you think about uh, like What's, what's your goal? Uh, obviously, everyone, as you said before, we all want to have our films shown for an audience. We want exposure, but um, and, and short animated films are really special in that um, you know a lot of times they're, the message is like directly from one person or a small team, and um, and I think there's a sort of a, kind of a artistic integrity that's there that. It, uh, in, in those types of projects that exist only in those types of projects. Um, but what about, I mean, do you think there's a way for filmmakers to make any kind of um, money from their short films? Or, and what do you think about some of these alternative distribution platforms? And do you put your uh, pieces on you know, YouTube and add advertising? You know, like, I'm just curious, like, what your... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I'm very happy to answer that. I mean, actually, uh, that is still kind of like to a certain extent an open question for me i mean so far um my opinion is almost a little bit split in that so i'm still hesitant to put all my films up there i mean i think there's an ongoing discussion uh in the in the animation community uh, uh about these matters but as far as i know and what i hear largely there is still not a really working model of online distribution which creates uh, substantial revenue. So, so my question or my answer has to be actually that uh, it depends. Yeah. I, it really depends there you, I mean, to me it is, um, I'm at the uh, interesting position or in the interesting situation that I have quite a library of films and I still uh, sell rights, uh, very kind of like uh, limited rights for certain purposes. For example, in Germany, the so-called non-commercial rights, which are only for the rights which go to libraries, schools and so forth. And there are special distribution companies and that still generates quite a decent amount of money which and also with the older films which I could not even get if I had everything freely available online so I think um, it's a little bit uh, depending on what you want to achieve 
if you are a really young filmmaker who wants to get known in the first place and you really have a piece out there which then you know make makes you um, quite popular with larger communities you even might want to build your career on creating an online following maybe that's the right way to go but it also comes with a risk that at the moment there your uh, work is f completely freely available it will be difficult to generate any revenue with the more traditional channels because they would probably not go for that now i understand and i know that that um, the possibilities are diminishing uh, in terms of traditional tv stations and so forth really buying content and you know and also licensing content but I think we're still in transitional phase there. It's not really decided are we going the way of a music industry right. or will there be a kind of uh, sustainable revenue model. And as, as long as this is not decided, as long as I have a substantial catalog of work, yeah. um, I really de decide on a case by case basis. Right, right. Now that makes sense. It's an important question. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, it, it, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it also has to do with the time you have at your hands. I think if you are able to invest a really, you know, a good amount of time in keeping your online presence, also maybe building a catalog of merchandise around that, special editions and so forth, uh, doing your own, building your own cottage industry with what some musicians kind of successfully do um, then that might be a um, possibility for you for me it's it's virtually impossible to even go down that route because I got too many things I'm doing at the same time that that uh, I don't really do that yeah. I mean maybe one last uh, comment on this one is that I believe then for festivals I think um, the overall policies have changed that it's not such a big problem to put a film online however I'm also not quite as enthusiastic as others are um, because there are still some festivals like Cannes mm -hmm. like the Academy Awards yeah. that this is a no-no right. and so I mean even though it might seem improbable you never know right. and you don't want to rob yourself of these possibilities, possibilities yeah. prematurely so I still keep warn my students against being you know putting it too soon up there right. yeah. well um all right well thank you thank you so much for thank this. you for the opportunity <laughs> that was big fun you yeah. know and just really very enjoyable to be here in the <laughs> place where it all happens it's such a, as i said such a lucky coincidence that that i was or am in new york right now yeah um, yeah, and it's always kind of, it's very, I mean, it's really a, a city there as it's not only John Kane maker, it's, you know, other people like Patrick Smith, you know, or, I mean, many, 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 many others. I mean, just, just to name but a few. I um, mean, you and so like, it's, it's, it's a very vibrant city in terms of animation and also, of course, in terms of design. Right. And so, yeah, it's always a pleasure to come here. <laughs>